<laughs> right. So today, <clears throat> next stage is you know, the position of frameworks, the um, source of some of the most important and valuable questions that we need to be able to ask in any given circumstance. So it's quite a lot of material today because we're going to be looking at three different, two or three different frameworks. And what you need to be able to do at the end of this session is really to be able to compare and contrast these two frameworks, the ISO um, 27K series, otherwise known as British Standard 7799, and the ITIL frameworks. They have different purposes, they do different things. And so you need to be able to see what the differences are, what the different questions are they help you to pose about your situation, and come up with really interesting uh, ways of ensuring good governance for the information and the processes and the systems within a sustainable, um, sustainably uh, governed organisation. So there are three sets of data that you, or sources you need. Uh, 27,002, the latest version is 27,000 and uh, two, 2013, I think. Uh, you need both of those. The 27,002-2013 is the very most modern one. The 27,002-2005 is the previous version and is slightly different. It has rather more questions to, that it asks of you than the more recent one. But both are actually quite useful. I want you to find what you can about the ITIL guidelines and some Office of uh, Office Central Government uh, guidelines that will help you again to understand about project, government project success. And you will also need to find COVID. COVID is the American version of corporate governance and basically was developed kind of post Enron when everything went really catastrophically wrong in terms of corporate information governance and corporate governance in general. And there's a document called Aligning COVID, ITIL and ISO 17799 for business benefit. And this is going to be quite valuable for you because it compares three different frameworks. The problem with this document is that it looks at 70, uh, 17799 or 27000 series as information security and information security alone rather than the broader perspective of information governance which is its true nature particularly if you're going through 27002 which is very much business and information governance with some concentration on security but not entirely. ITGI is an important organisation, as is the Office of Government, uh, Commerce, and also the IT Service Management Forum. These are three critical organisations who are involved in setting standards, in setting or providing guidelines to businesses, government organisations, um, anybody who really wants to be good at developing, implementing, and maintaining effective information technology based services. There are many others as well, but these are three critical ones that I'm interested in at the moment in this session. I'm not going to read all of these words because these are just cut and paste from various parts of that, doc that comparison document. So it's been around ITGI, it's been around for quite a while. And it's there to help businesses understand what they need to do with information technology. Because as they say in this bottom paragraph, if we have effective governance of our information, our information technology, the processes, the procedures <coughs> that work all around the, the technology and make it work with humans involved, then it kind of helps us to be effective in meeting what we need to do as an organization. And as importantly, 
by identifying the risks and the vulnerabilities that come from our technology and our processes, maybe it helps us to be a little bit better. And this is actually has been the subject or, or the top, key topic of many of my conference presentations over the last year, is how do we or can we avoid some of those horrendous risks and vulnerabilities that continue to cause companies and organizations to have problems with their IT and then lose enormous amounts of brand reputation. I mean, just think of what's happened to Samsung over the last fortnight or so with the Note 7, the Galaxy Note 7. It's going to be incredibly difficult for that company to rebuild its brand values. You know, it takes you 10, 20, 30 years to build a brand value. You can lose it almost in seconds particularly if you don't address it in the right sort of way. OGC are set to work with our, the UK public sector, where we know they have been sadly ineffective in many respects at developing IT systems <coughs> to support themselves <coughs> and us, the public out there. Right, we know that there are some government websites which work a treat. You know, how many of you got cars? And we all go online once or twice a year to renew uh, the road tax. And that works a treat, basically, doesn't it? Has it ever failed you? No, it's trivial. It is three call, does exist, th this particular car, license number, in the MOT database with a valid MOT, in the insurance database that all insurers feed into with a valid and current um, insurance policy and there's another one that it has to do as well. Three simple does exist inquiries to three different tables. It's trivial and it works. But so many other systems are hard work. You go round and round in circles, it fails because they're much more complex and more complicated and connect to different systems and so on. OGC is there to try and help organisations to do better. Sadly, the evidence, evidence isn't there that it really works very well. ITIL is all is government published and it's all about good and better and best practices for producing and running and delivering IT related services. And the ISO standard 27002, 2005 2013, published by the International Organization for Standards. And this is a huge uh, collaboration between the standards organizations of almost all countries. And it states that it is a framework for a standard for information security management. It's selling itself very short because this standard does an awful lot more than that. It's actually about information governance across an organization and between organizations. So it is much, much more than purely information security. So one of the questions I want you to discuss as you go through the rest of the seminar after we finish the session, at least talk, come back to this slide number eight and think about why do we need a set <coughs> of best practices? A subsidiary question to that is, are best practices really useful or do we just need to have really good practice? Can we actually achieve all best practice and can all of us achieve a best practice? What is the definition of best practice? And then a question is why might we want to have a set of best practices for IT related activities? Now partly I'm going to give you a bit of an answer here. A bit of a yeah kind of an answer, it's kind of a set of questions that follow on from these. Because you can actually take each statement and turn it around. So 
If we look at where at the, the documents that are driving this lecture, this is, this is what they state. Now, the question is, take the first one. In what way, A, is IT critical to the success of an organization? And therefore, how does this management of IT become absolutely crucial? How can best practices, published best practices, help us to achieve effective governance of IT? These are the claims on pages 5 and 11 of that document that this is what it will do. It's very flat-footed. It will do this. Now, you need to think about it from the other perspective. Why is it capable, or why are they capable of helping us to do effective governance? Why do we need management frameworks to tell everybody what to do? And are policies actually effective? Think of ISO 9000, another series of ISO policies and standards about doing business, to summarize it. And what is necessary in the way that businesses take on these standards and good practices to help them get the efficiency gains? Because we see, for example, the field of big data and analytics, we see all the hype about you get 5, 10, X percent benefit in terms of productivity, in terms of profitability, turnover, revenue, whatever, if you do big data analytics. And the reality is, Maybe 10% of big organizations actually get those claimed benefits, and, don't, and most other people don't get it. So what are they doing wrong? Are they not following these guidelines? Or is it that most, it is actually very difficult for most organizations to get anywhere near this lot? Is it really true that having good procedure, good frameworks, good standards actually help you to rely less on experts? Or do you still need the experts around to actually be effective? Can you actually get the benefits by having these standards <coughs> and going through the tick box? I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. So they then provide a few little sort of thoughts about some of the ways that maybe you can get some value from these best practices. Thinking about risk uh, management within an organization, the risk assessment, risk identification, risk management, mitigation, pra mitigating pra uh, practice, and so on. You need to have something that's scalable to the organization. And this is where I have a real problem for most organizations, not all, but most of something heavyweight like COBIT, like other project management um, one uh, framework such as PRINCE2, very, very heavyweight. Not really appropriate for half of the organization, or most of the organizations in the country. Now you've got 10,000 companies in the medium and large size in this country, and you've got 4.8 million companies with sort of um, what, about 50 empl or 100 employees and less, can they all do this? Or is it really only the very, very big ones? So how do you scale different uh, approaches, different practices to different sized organizations? And they suggest that you also need to do some integration of these best practice variety services management with the rest of the things you're actually doing in the organization already. But the problem there is that sm the smaller an organization is and the more it needs to think about doing this, the less time and resource they've actually got to, con to concentrate on this. I mean, a 50-person or 100-person company probably has one person in sort of work, practices, and IT. You know, supporting the network, supporting the systems, keeping them up and running, and then you've got to start thinking about all of that. Where's that going to happen? It's easy if you've got 10,000 or 20,000 employees 
you can easily find one or two people, a little team, to start doing that sort of work. No trouble at all. It gets lost in the, in the, the change almost in terms of cost. But if you've only got 100 people in your employees, that's difficult. If you've got 10 employees, infinitely more difficult. <clears throat> so how do we do this, come from this? And then one of the magical things about all of these processes and procedures in any big organisation or any small organisation is you've got some procedures, you've written them down, and then people have got the work to do. They're on the phone, they're on the computers, they're doing the work that gets the money into the organisation. So these working practices, policies, procedures go into a nice glossy folder and it goes on top of the highest shelf in the organisation. And it's forgotten. But you need to embed it. And therein lies yet another interesting and quite difficult question. How do you get management and staff to actually do this? I mean, think about in security, viruses, email viruses, and so on. We all know what we shouldn't do. We know we shouldn't click on random files in emails from people we've never heard of. And, kind of, we do, every now and then. Because we are inquisitive sometimes. And we forget, or can't be bothered, or it won't happen to me. So, those three slides of this is why we need best practices from that document, comparing COVID, ITIL, and um, I said 2002, actually leads to lots of interesting questions about why or how we can follow these practices rather than giving us advice about how to actually do them. Now, if we look back at, and then step back a little bit and think, well, why, do we, what, why are we worried about all this? Well, in terms of business drivers, and whether these are written back in 2005 or wrote, written today, write the same stuff. IT is stunningly value destructive. Partly because, you know, 40%, well, no, 28, 29% of systems going on time to budget delivering some business value. 28%, maybe 29%. All the rest fail to deliver business value or are cancelled. And those that go in, even if they do deliver value for the 20% of functionality that they deliver compared to what used to be done, we have to do an awful lot of manual work around and finding other ways of recording the transactions and so on. So we have to spend a lot more time doing the job than if we had really effective systems. It's not always the, um, it's not always the IT guy's fault though, Usually, it, especially if it's a government business. Because government want to want it done quickly and really cheaply, and it's not possible. I'm not pointing the finger at the IT specialist who creates it. It's out mostly elsewhere. Although the the business sponsors of these systems would point, ah, oh, my IT team's incompetent. By and large, it isn't that. It's the fact that we don't know how to capture perfect requirement specification. The business sponsors typically will give us 30% less time and resource than a good estimate would give us and st standards group reports tell us that actually if you really want to be successful you don't reduce the budget you add 150 percent contingency to time scale price and everything else and then apply very tight project and program management cap uh, activities to it and if you do that you might be on time and businesses Management do not like the idea of adding 150% contingency. This is kind of a bit counterintuitive. It's not feasible. They always want it done quicker. And that kind of is part of. And also they won't allow enough money to do the full job, by and large. Which is why when 
Standish group, I think, one of the reasons why when Standish group include or change the definition of success from on time to budget delivering all functionality to on time to budget delivering business value, counterintuitively the success rate dropped by 10 or 12 percent. We know that there is massively increasing levels of IT spend and it's not changing the overall bottom line profitability of businesses. It's still, for ordinary sorts of businesses, 3-4%. And then there are, in terms of banking, Um, <clears throat> then many areas <coughs> we're getting more and more regulatory requirements and the financial world particularly, and the list there is basically a whole series of regulations that are governing the financial services business and having just squeezed in MIFID 1 some years back, MIFID 2 is coming, a new version is coming along and no one really knows, if it's anything like MIFID 1, what the fine definition is, because the, the negotiations for all of the big um, international agreements tends to be nice and broad and wide, but the system developers need really tight definitions of various things. And they weren't delivered until about a month and a half before MIFID 2 went live, and this caused lots of problems. So business drivers, we do want to get better returns. We are worried about the increasing levels of spend on IT without any benefit in the bottom line. And there is more and more regulatory uh, impositions. And if, in terms of more widely, you know, things like data protection regimes. We're also moving most of our IT out from our own environment, our own private environment, to outsourcing and the cloud. Network and data security and hackers is becoming more and more critical. I see, saw yesterday that GCHQ is getting involved now in all of these smart meters to make sure that we can't be hacked, that our homes can't be switched off by uh, from remotely and and and. More and more of the critical functionality of businesses going into their computer, into the computer systems. And we need to keep the service alive 24-7-365 mostly. And this is ha has been happening now, this bottom one, standardization, with things like ERP systems and all of these software as a service systems. So there's huge things going on that are making it more and more difficult in many respects for businesses to get value. They have to be more innovative, they have to be cleverer than anybody else. <coughs> and to add insult to injury, more and more of these frameworks keep popping out of the woodwork. Some of these are project management um, processes and uh, methodologies, and some of them are information governance, some of them are uh, to do with organizing your business. More and more and more. So how do we choose between them? Well, with difficulty. So what I'm going to cover very briefly is a little bit about ITIL. This is the UK government provided IT services management approach. There's a couple of state sections of that. Trying to help businesses to actually deliver effective IT services management. It goes back to you know, IT services management in your second year. I think the most important word to take away from there is the word appropriate. One of the problems is <coughs> that too often the systems are, here is the whole thing, take it or leave it. Here is the whole framework, take it or leave it. You can't cherry pick, you can't use the best bits for yourself. You've got to use the whole thing. And that kind of is a bit of a problem on occasion. 
ITIL is comprehensive and consistent. And it provoke, promotes quality. In other words, you're thinking about quality of services, quality of the HCI, quality of everything in meeting the needs of your users. The service support side of ITIL is looking at post-implementation, keeping that service alive once you put it in place. The service delivery section is all about how to make sure, as you design the Beastie, that you've covered all the bases. Have you got the right capacity? Are you like egg and size the system for normal use and forget that at that launch moment, because you've done so much promotion, you're going to be, your network, your servers, your databases are going to be hammered real, really seriously. And maybe you need to think about a massive ramping up of your capability at the front end and then let it die away. You, know, you, you guys know Turnitin. You know that if you try Turnitin today, it'll work a treat. You also know from past and bitter experience that come the last week or so of term, middle of December, it might not be very effective. It might take a long time to happen. And we see it with you know, our own internal systems. Um, sometimes around the first week or so of term, Blackboard goes a tad slow perhaps because everybody is piling in, all the academics loading material, all the students finding out the timetables, finding out what's happening. Capacity management is a very tricky problem, as is availability. And did, did we not hear over the weekend that RBS and Ulster Bank had another little problem of access? Yet again, what was that? RBS and um, Ulster Bank had another access problem over the weekend. People couldn't get at their accounts and such like. System wasn't available. <coughs> and so on and so forth. <coughs> so the modern version of ITIL covers approaches to de developing your systems, designing and planning this uh, whole network of communications and such like operating, maintaining existing systems, and then the ongoing maintenance to make sure the darn thing actually meets the needs of the business. These are what Brett the ITIL is all about. And it tries to give, lead you into thinking about the whole of the system. Not just the IT, the technology, the screens, the keyboards, the servers, but also the people. Also, the non-functional side, not just how it does the job, but how does it protect the information? How do you make it reliable? How do you keep it all there? How do you make sure availability is there as well as all the other integrity and so on aspects? It provides guidance that suggests you need to make sure you have tested the software or the system effectively. But we see it's quite tricky. How many of you looked at that um, presentation I did up at, uh, in York a couple of weeks ago? Anybody seen that, looked at it yet? If not, have a look at what I said there and how the audience were kind of agreeing that you know, even as test engineers, the art of testing is still not a science. It is difficult to do fully effective testing. All sorts of long-term holistic approaches. Think about the customer, not just the sponsor, the guy who is, or the woman, who is the high-level um, custodian of the system and is paying for the work, but the people who are going to use it, the actual users. All sorts of questions here. Because although they are, again, posed as the answers, this is what you've got to do, what you've got to do, to make it work, you have to ask a lot of questions about, in the context, about how can you do this? How do you, if you're developing an app, actually get the user's feedback? 
how do you get the users to tell you what they really need on a banking app, for example? Or do you just, as an expert, an expert there, say, oh, this is what we need. And this is the UI, uh, UX, is the user experience that's required. Where's the user's input? But one of the things we do know is that any system where the users themselves are not included, and you did that with Dennis last year with ID product development, you did it in the first year with the, um, the, the module, which is in the first semester, that you designed some interfaces and so on. If you don't involve the user, the real user, you'll probably get it wrong. So how do you do that with smart device apps, for example? Yes, you can monitor usage easily, you can monitor response times in the hardware, that's trivial. Although, not necessarily everybody does it. But if you think about the services, not just the IT, but the processes, the procedures, and all the people involved, how do you monitor the performance of the overall service? So, to question two for later on this morning. Which is more important, the service support side of ITIL or the service delivery of ITIL? And why has ITIL focused on this holistic approach? If you don't understand the word holistic, look it up and get defined, get the definitions. Go into Google, type in define holistic and see what it says. So why is ITIL so interested in this holistic perspective of the service and so interested in the customer orientation as opposed to the technical and technological sort of focuses. ISO 27000 is a series of standards that's been around since about 1999 when the first version of I, uh, British Standard 7799 was published. It's now sort of expanded and expanded and across the world as 27,000. There are a whole set of different standards from 27,000 to about 27,010 or 12. <coughs> you can find them in the British Standards online and you can see just how many different Guide, sets of guidelines there are that target at different parts of information security, information uh, governance, and different industries. And it's focused both on internal information security and governance and relationships between organizations. And 27001 is a, a method of understanding how you can prove to others around your customers, your suppliers, that you are actually doing the right sort of thing. So 27001 is the process of security and uh, information security and information governance that you can be audited on and you can get certification on. 27002, however, is much more interesting because it asks you interesting and valuable questions. And it's based around meeting legal and good practices, legal requirements and good practices, focuses particularly on these areas, but not exclusively. It looks at the information security policies you need to think about. It helps you to assign responsibility for information security to different members of the organisational team. And last but not least, it talks about business continuity management. And there's a standard, BS, British, uh, ISO standard 25999, which is all about business continuity management. It's another really valuable ISO standard to get hold of. <coughs> ISO 27000 introduces a, some different concepts to ITIL about critical success factors. These are some thoughts, some ideas which have been found in gen generally applicable to most organisations that help you to be successful in the field of information governance. 
and we see some of these are reflected in the ideas from the Standish Group reports about how to have successful projects. Some of these are particularly about ISO, uh, about information governance in general. For example, this thing about users are trained. That's part one of the solutions, perhaps, to getting people to buy into being doing better security, better everything else that was mentioned earlier on. And it suggests that if you really do want to monitor and manage the performance of the, the whole service, then you need to be thinking quite carefully about how that should be done. And if you go back, remember back to your IT Services Management assignment, one of the critical questions, the last section of the assignment, was all about how do you measure the success of your service? Come back here, come back in. So you can see the linkages also between the modules. These are essentially the 10 major sections of ISO 27002, helping you to ask the right questions about a whole range of things. And there's essentially a chapter on each of those in the ISO standard. One other thing that's important that's not on the slides here, but is valuable for you, is to think of in the latest version of 27002, in this introduction section, section zero, uh, or section 0 0.2, should I say, there are the three critical pillars of information governance. And they are risk assessment to help you tune your whole approach to your organization to make it appropriate for the organization. Because that helps you to then ask the right sets of questions because you've prioritized uh, on the basis of risk to your organization which of the, these sections are necessary. The second pillar is that you comply with all relevant external regulations, laws, contracts, etc. And the third pillar is that you actually, as an organization, comply with all of your own policies and procedures. So three pillars. One, risk assessment to identify the critical things you need to do. Two, make sure you comply with everything from outside. And three, make sure you comply with everything you've got set out on the inside. <clears throat> so, two quite different approaches to information governance and um, information services delivery. Can we combine them? Can we combine ITIL and 27002? Maybe. It particularly does if you think about 27002 helping to define what you should be doing. And then ITIL provides you with guidance on the how to do it. What is, comes clear, out clearly from both of the systems or methods, standards, is you've got to make sure what you do fits the individual organisation. Hence the need to know the questions, not the answers. Because the answer for every organisation, every situation, will be different. It'll be different for each system that you implement within an organisation. You can't do it all the time, so you've got to prioritise. And so a risk assessment approach, pillar, zero, uh, pillar one of 27002, is kind of helpful for you to work out which needs to be done first. Where are the risks, the vulnerabilities, maybe even where are the biggest opportunities? So where do you use these practices to drive the project successfully? As you go into doing the project, planning is very clearly raised by both approaches, particularly ITIL. But you can't rely on the process and procedures and methods and methodologies all the time. You've got to think sensibly. Because some of the methodologies, some of the practical processes and procedures are just too heavyweight. And the, the cost of doing it will outweigh the benefits. So you've got to be pragmatic. And although 
The idea is you align with these best practices, you pick up on these best practices, you've got to be realistic. So you apply pragmatism and say, actually, we don't really need all of this, we can use this, this, and this bit. And so that's the point of that integration and bringing together multiple uh, frameworks. Be pragmatic as to which bits are going to give you the benefits. And that's why I want you to spend this, to, this today and Thursday in the workshop looking at particularly ITIL and ISO 27002 and thinking in terms of the services and the things you're doing for your assignment. In this world of extremely uncertain data, what are the lessons we can learn from ITIL and ISO 27002 which will help us to be successful, that help you to write that really great article that you're working on? So do some research, discuss about best practices, why they work, if they do work, and then start thinking much more carefully about integrating the relevant bits from ITIL and from ISO 27002 and other, you know, there are opportunities to look at other frameworks as well and see whether you can cherry pick some relevant bits that in here you can say and demonstrate, so suitable citations and so on, that these are in the context the best way of doing it. So frameworks are sets of questions that help you to succeed. Okay folks, off to it. Get the research done, start thinking, talking, and then we'll um, have discussions at various points.